Okay. Hello, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Uh, so I was planning this talk to be fairly simple, so I would like to well, give you a fairly easy journey through what we've been doing with less code than, well, previously maybe, uh, hopefully. So uh, I think it will be something um, where you can rest a bit after yesterday's party. Um, <clears throat> all right, so a bit about myself. So as mentioned, I'm a team leader at Okado Technology. Um, I'm also an FPS enthusiast. Uh, I've been working with Scala for at least five years, um, well, in different companies maybe. Uh, luckily or recently in Okado, I have a chance to use Scala at, well, full scale because the, the projects we are dealing with are solely based on Scala uh, and Scala tooling. Um, and also, well, after work or sometimes during holiday, I'm a consultant, uh, trainer, uh, mostly on the Scala, big data, um, or com uh, distributed computing uh, topics. So about Tocado, maybe just to put you in the picture, uh, so that uh, have some grasp of what we are talking about, uh, what kind of services we need to deal with, and what kind of problems we need to solve on a daily basis. Uh, so just briefly, what Tocado is. It's a, a company established 16 years ago, about, and um, its goal is to change the, the way uh, retail market works. It's mostly investing in automated processes that, well, everything from the order to delivery should be automated uh, with, well, as little compromises as possible. So that's why it relies heavily on, on its automated so-called uh, fulfillment centers. I, I will show you in a bit, well, what it looks like. Um, and it delivers products directly to customers. Well, and it hires uh, people uh, in Hatfield, but also we have offices in uh, Wrocław and Kraków in Poland. So this is one of the such uh, fulfillment centers. Uh, so those robots resembling, well, I think R2D2 maybe, but the cubic version of R2D2 uh, are responsible for distributing uh, products uh, to the uh, packing centers, I would say. Uh, and by the way, uh, we have a team of developers, I think, in this room also, working on the um, uh, management, warehouse management systems for, for this warehouse. Uh, this one is, I think, well, by, by the name, third in a row, uh, but uh, first in using this technology, and another one is in product, well, is in construction that I think will be ready this year. Um, and the, by the way, the software uh, being used for managing this uh, fulfillment center uh, is fully developed in Scala using, I think, Scala and uh, Aka Streams and some morning stuff. Um, so now I would like structure this presentation. Uh, so I would like to start with, well, a few words about uh, the platform itself. What, what are the, uh, the basic uh, foundations? Uh, then, uh, the main part will be about the stability patterns we are using. So, hopefully some of them are pretty well recognized, uh, while some of them are perhaps new to you. So, I would like to walk you through some of those we are using on a daily basis and some other selected observations, right? Because we, we don't have enough time to walk through all the observations we had when using Scala and uh, AWS. Well, so smart platform. So this is the new, uh, Okado started as the retail store, but what we are building now is the new version of it that is going to be sold as a product to the customers such as Tesco, Auchan, so, so huge retailers who want to actually become Okado on their own, I would say, backyard. Uh, so Okado platform consists of, well, I haven't counted, maybe uh, easily, I think, uh, more than 100 services. Uh, so. Okado has invested a lot of effort to uh, adjust the way we work, adjust the, the, uh, from the cultural perspective and technology perspective, actually to correctly build those services and to align these efforts. Uh, so the foundations to actually achieve this, right? Because this is a platform that has been built from scratch and to make it happen, well, there were certain foundations uh, established. So first, um, well, as, uh, which, which is kind of common for the microservice world, the components should be fairly, <clears throat> fairly small. Uh, so the common pattern is that each service should be 
uh, small enough to be rewritten in several weeks by a team. Um, uh, but also, what matters, they should be cohesive. So each service should, should be playing uh, a certain role or what is also important, by <coughs> using uh, domain-driven design roles. And the service should be um, working with certain bounded context. So it should be, for instance, related to a single domain, like a product or uh, like a price, or like a basket. Uh, and from the technical also point of view, so those principles, those foundations, this is something that is being shared across all services in Ocado. So uh, either by the internal contracts that, were, that are, for instance, audited, uh, or by the technical limitations, simply, uh, you cannot actually cross some rules. So one of them is actually sharing resources. So practically, even if we were crazy enough uh, to do something like sharing database between two services, uh, uh, honestly, I wouldn't know how to do it, uh, if it was even possible. Um, uh, also, the services use common protocol, a uh, common set of rules uh, to easily traverse and integrate each service. And also, it also, it also helps with, with um, I would say, swapping people uh, when they actually change their mood and would like to work with something else for a while. Uh, the protocol, by the protocol, I mean the... Um, things such as network protocols, uh, application protocols. So basically we use HTTP with REST, JSON, simply, and some rules uh, on top of REST uh, and a JSON, such as uh, uh, request tracing, which I will refer to a bit. Um, the next important bit is the DevOps culture. So practically in the microservices world, uh, I wouldn't imagine actually building services of this scale not having the strong DevOps culture. So this is a very strong foundation. Well, this should be followed, uh, in my opinion, in every company that, well, aspires a bit <coughs> to effectively work with such um, environment. Uh, well, in our case, this means that practically each team is responsible for um, making the tool chain work from, from the moment they write the code, uh, commit, review, until the production deployment. So it's all in the hands of, of the developers, not, um, uh, <clears throat> I would say, team of experts who know how the production system works. Uh, and well, which is, I think, the, the, the starting point. It should be perhaps the first. Uh, well, using uh, Kalnix word, so this is the former CEO of Uber, luckily. Uh, well, but in this case, actually, this makes sense. We are responsible for our own shit, and uh, which means that uh, the freedom takes the responsibility, and this, this should kind of work in, in both ways. So if the developers decide to use certain piece of technology, to adopt certain process. Uh, they will be called in the night, at night, uh, and well, this actually makes you think twice. And the last important foundation uh, that uh, has been made, uh, it's called cloud first. So whatever we do, uh, whatever decision uh, we make, we um, assume that the cloud will be the first choice when selecting the technology, uh, well, for the sake of efficiency, um, flexibility. Uh, maybe not necessarily, not always, uh, for the sake of cost. Uh, now, from the tooling point of view, uh, what makes uh, service development, not only in Scala, but, well, any world easier and faster, is to have the common set of tooling. And <coughs> What we have uh, is based on uh, common lock indexing, common uh, monitoring uh, features, uh, infrastructure provisioning, CI CD tools, um, and request tracking. So most of them uh, are available to any team, all of the teams. Well, if you're crazy enough, of course, you can use your own monitoring tool. You can set it up. <clears throat> but well, it usually just doesn't make sense because you have pretty good choice of what's available. Uh, the last one is, is quite interesting, uh, request tracking, tracing. Uh, so this is a pattern I would like to show you with. Um, there are some tools on the market, definitely. One of them that I could uh, recommend is, for instance, Twitter Zipkin. Uh, so 
in microservices world, when a single request, starting from the user's action, is, is kicked off, it usually touches, well, at least several services. It can be even tens. So how do you know how this request was populated? It's like a, a brain signal, right? There is a, an impulse, and it actually expands or explodes to many, electro, to many neurons, right? So this neuron can be resembled, uh, can be an well, analogy to uh, a service. Uh, so how do you know which neurons actually were affected? So this is what tracing actually helps you with, uh, to, to identify those neurons, those services, and, and uh, uh, also have the insight what happened. And this is actually a good example. Uh, I picked it from our <coughs> Slack. Uh, so service tracing means that you attach a request ID to each request, and this request ID is being um, a attached to every subsequent request uh, that has the same origin. So this way, well, you can uh, use it to identify, uh, I would say, the origin, so the user's action, uh, no matter, well, the traverse de death. Like in this case, uh, during the support, we get a request, request ID <laughs> has timed out, <coughs> sorry. Uh, could you help us with that? Uh, so having this information, uh, we are able to actually locate in all services, in the all services logs, well, what happens in each particular layer. Like uh, in the next slide, actually it's an example uh, how I was able to track this request. By using the request ID, I was able to see all the logs from all the services uh, which touched this particular request. This is actually, uh, by the way, uh, so-called um, Alex Stack, Elasticsearch Logit Kibana. Uh, and another thing uh, is monitoring, also part of the common stack. It's quite common, actually. Uh, I mean, this particular tool It's New Relic, um, uh, very popular in the AWS because, well, it actually gives you a similar uh, feel that you will have with even with the profiler, uh, what, while we can call it a profiler running well continuously in a production environment, because practically you can drill down up to the uh, <clears throat> call level of what happened during the uh, request execution. Um, so this is another, well, I would say, side effect of having this um, infrastructure architecture. Now, drilling down. So what we have uh, in our backyard. Uh, so the project I'm, the piece of the project I'm dealing with in particular, our, our team, uh, is responsible for evaluating uh, uh, <clears throat> prices of products. And those services are only uh, developed in Scala, so you are lucky enough to uh, be such team to uh, justify a use of Scala. So each team has this flexibility, and well, we take the responsibility. Uh, our services calculate prices and taxes, uh, <clears throat> locate and apply promotions, aggregate other payments, uh, such as, well, as in examples, delivery, charges, bugs. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is just to show you that, well, each service in such environment can be, well, a hub, practically, because uh, it gets the request, and then it needs to expand this request to <clears throat> well, number, host of other requests to other services just to collect them. So this is uh, where we uh, identified uh, a usefulness of, of Scala transformations, well, monadic structures, uh, and uh, reactive programming. Uh, now, it looks good, I mean, well, tool is right for the job, but what could go wrong? So uh, what kind of problems we need to deal with? Um, so each order translates to practically hundreds of user actions, so which means that when a user is in the shop, uh, well, you can imagine, so you visited the shop, uh, you want to order products, so first you need to, well, search for them, you need to make choices. If your basket consists of, <clears throat> let's say, 20 products, it usually happens that you will click the sites, well, maybe even 100 times and doing uh, 50 searches on the way. So which means that our platform uh, is going to scale to tens of thousands of requests, oh sorry, of orders uh, per, I don't know, week, let's say. It actually translates uh, from our perspective 
to even tens of thousands of requests per second sometimes on each service, on, well, particular services. And uh, also each uh, evaluation that we uh, uh, collect, so each evaluation request that we collect needs also to, to uh, hit some other services. So the number of issues, well, things that can go wrong is actually, even, even if everything is in the perfect world, uh, so every service is, is fine, uh, uh, and the chance of error is very small, by the multiplication effects, actually have pretty good chance of failure. And uh, our contract is that we should deliver the response in 100 milliseconds also. <coughs> So now how, to, how we deal with that to actually achieve this contract? So, so what we call it is uh, what I call it, also I, I have taken it from the book that I will cite later, <coughs> it's called stability patterns. So very likely you will know most of them, but I will also refer to some Scala, I would say applications or implementations that you could use. Well, so first one is retry. Uh, I think most basic one, most of you know <coughs> what it does. And uh, what does successful retry means, uh, or when it really works? So first of all, uh, well, the request needs to be recoverable. So uh, uh, I would say common knowledge. Uh, but when you are in the AWS world, uh, even some of the things that seem unrecoverable can be unrecoverable. Uh, can be recoverable. I will give you an example. You have. Uh, usually three instances behind, <coughs> behind the load balancer. So even if you, well, uh, get a, a message or response that a service is un unavailable, it's very likely that the next request actually succeeds because it, the load balancer will lead to another, another instance. So this also means that uh, there should be such instances. So if you don't have them, well, don't do retry. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, when you are using AWS, but also other cloud providers, make sure that your load balancer is not uh, configured with sticky sessions. Because with what sticky sessions mean, that uh, the load balancer will add uh, a cookie to the request uh, to make sure that each subsequent request from this particular user will lead to the same instance because it's assuming that that instance will have some, let's say, state, in memory state usually. Uh, we try to avoid it, by the way. So we, we don't use the sticky session and also it's usually a good practice not to use it, but well, just make sure. Uh, and also, doesn't make sense at all to make retry if you have very aggressive uh, timeouts. And, well, you should be aware of your timeouts. Uh, so if you are close to 100 milliseconds and <clears throat> the retry would mean that uh, you have at least, well, less than 10 milliseconds to fulfill, fulfill the request, doesn't make sense. And <coughs> what, sorry, uh, retry can lead to also, which you should be, um, uh, aware of, it could lead to, uh, well, storming the so-called uh, upstream systems, so the systems you depend on, <coughs> with number of requests. So re returning to this analogy of neurons, so imagine the situation, the top level services has uh, received a, a, a failure response, so it retries, but the problem lies in the Top, well, very low level database problem. Uh, so it goes again through all the services downstream, uh, so, well, sorry, upstream, <coughs> uh, to collect the response again. And when it happens, well, over and over again. So practically, this problem of the re request explosion actually can, call, uh, can cause the system, well, major system crash, actually, not one particular service. <clears throat> so the next one, uh, also very straightforward one, uh, timeout. And basic true about timeout, well, is well if you cannot wait for the success, just go ahead and well, go without it. And this is a very important one because it prevents failures from from uh, <clears throat> uh, escalating. Escalation can be uh, resulting, for instance, from uh, saturating the resources. Uh, for instance. Um, 
when uh, you infinitely wait for a response from a database, you may hold a connection, you may hold a thread <coughs> without the timeout. Uh, uh, this can happen at infinity, which means that at infinity you have, well, blocked thread. And uh, with the certain limited thread pool, uh, this means also that uh, you will be quickly running out of the resources. <coughs> and also important that imp implementation in Scala is not necessarily, not always straightforward. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, so some of your options. Well, you can use Ask Pattern if you're using Akka. <coughs> You can use Scala Futures or Awaitable, and you can also use Monix. So with Akka, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure if all of you have used Akka, but well, basically this, this code snippet shows well what, what would ha could happen. So practically here, I'm creating, I'm having an actor which I'm expecting a response for, from, and this actor is called my actor. So I'm sending a message and I'm expecting it to be delivered, the response to be delivered within 15 seconds. <coughs> In the result, I have a future. Uh, so within 15 seconds, I will get either uh, failure in this future or success. Well, it seems fine, but uh, it, in my opinion, well, unless you are not using Akka in all the project, uh, it's a bit of overhead. So like uh, cracking nut with a sledgehammer. It's still not blocking, but also not easy straightforward to test. So if you need to have a control over time, to test well, what would happen after 15 seconds, uh, well, you can use some uh, fresh sleeps in your test, not necessarily uh, uh, fun. Uh, you can also <coughs> use Scala Future, uh, but for, for it to be well useful, actually you need to have an implementation of your kind of a scheduler, which will create a thread or span, sorry, span a, a future result after a certain time, uh, which is not a straightforward implementation. Uh, so it doesn't come with Scala itself. Uh, an alternative to using this one is even less funny uh, approach to using Scala awaitable, which means that you are blocking a thread. <coughs> and uh, uh, I won't actually go further the, the stream, just, just don't use await. Uh, but it's also not so funny to test. Um, but, well, at least this version is non-blocking. And, well, in my opinion, well, also it looks straightforward, uh, is to use Monix. So basically, I will show you in a few more examples that Monix actually is usually, at least in my case, in my opinion, a tool of choice whenever you need to deal with some element of time, because it has very good support for uh, scheduling. And um, not only that, well, the API is straightforward, but also uh, testing is. Uh, so Monix comes with something called a test scheduler. So scheduler in Monix is uh, equivalent to uh, execution context in pure Scala. <coughs> uh, and uh, it, in test, uh, the test scheduler gives you an ability to practically control time. Uh, like Dr. Strange. So uh, you can actually tell Monix, just go ahead one millisecond, go ahead 20 milliseconds, and well, you observe the result. Well, the next <coughs> uh, pattern, I think uh, well-recognized one, is the circuit breaker. Basically, a circuit breaker is a state machine. So it can, uh, it is being used to track the state of the upstream system and uh, depending on the responses from the observing uh, <coughs> responses of the backend of the uh, observer system, it changes the state. Uh, in case of meeting certain threshold, like five requests in a row have failed, it will change the state to open, like a circuit breaker <coughs> in your homes, right? That will break the circuit so that, well, basically your house doesn't burn due to electrical failure. And also it has ability to return from the normal, from, from the failed state to normal, uh, also after something called <coughs> reset timeout. So now, the implementation. So we have a few, at least a few, so I haven't listed all of them. Uh, Akka, Monix, uh, Finagle also give, uh, gives you this ability, auto breaker. I won't go through all of them. Uh, i just give you uh, a small snippet of what Silk Breaker use uh, uh, looks like when using, well, plain Akka. So it's fairly straightforward. Uh, but basically you need to provide 
<coughs> at least those few parameters. So how many failures you need to uh, open the circuit breaker? So move it from the closed state to open state. Uh, uh, what is the timeout? So timeout is considered to be a failure. So after if, if a request to the uh, backend system fails, sorry, doesn't return in 10 seconds, it's considered a failure. And after what time, <coughs> you, you should try returning from the uh, open state to half open and then in the uh, half open to closed state. So circuit breaker being in half open state is kind of probing the backend system. Uh, probing means that it sends the request, uh, a kind of uh, an agent, uh, a spy. If this request succeeds, it goes back to closed state. And uh, configuration considerations um, that are important. Uh, one is the, the failure, <coughs> failure threshold. So after how many failures you should, you should fail? Well, this is very, I would say, individual. You should uh, be aware of your system. So observe the uh, logs. Uh, usually, it's, it's less than 10. But perhaps with some, some uh, heavy use systems or maybe systems that uh, you don't consider reliable and doesn't need to be reliable, you may increase the number. Uh, but the bigger consideration comes when you think about the reset timeout. Because the reset timeout has the implication of uh, something that I would call uh, reset, or returning to uh, normal state escalation. So if you have, for instance, uh, the situation that the services are stacked, so top level service call uh, another service, that one calls another and another and another, and you have five in a row, and each one of them has one minute reset timeout, this means that return to normal for all of them actually doesn't necessarily mean one minute. It can be actually summed up to five uh, in the well, worst situation. Uh, so usually use the reset timeout, uh, set the reset timeout to something that you consider a time of reset uh, for your system, uh, for, the downstream, for the upstream system that you are calling. And lastly, fallback action. <clears throat> so this is, well, sometimes uh, we, f we forget about uh, or just don't matter about. Well, this is important actually uh, to have if you don't want to be called at night. Uh, so fallback gives you an ability to decide what to do when a service you depend on doesn't work. And the best, uh, sorry, the, the simplest solution is just not to have the fallback. Well, so this is a uh, pretty naive one. So which means, well, it just propagates the error. Uh, which means that, well, if the circuit is in the open state uh, and all requests don't even reach the backend system, let's say for 15 seconds, you fail the, all the requests. So for 15 seconds, you are completely unavailable. Uh, not a nice scenario. Uh, maybe a better one is to use a cached value, if you can allow it. Uh, you can return a default value, uh, quite likely in many scenarios. Like for instance, in our case, we have uh, 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 services that ask for the prices of um, uh, plastic bags that don't change a lot. So we use some kind of fallback value if, if such things fail. Uh, <coughs> uh, and also, uh, if you can afford it, you can use alternative service. Uh, basically, the, the rule of a thumb is just to use circuit breakers whenever you need to integrate with uh, an upstream system. Uh, and the reset timeout, as mentioned earlier, uh, should be correlated with what you expect to be the reset time of the system that is failing. Reset time means, for instance, restart. Well, for JVM, I would say the rule of a thumb, it will be like 10 to 15 milliseconds uh, for the JVM to start up. Uh, so you shouldn't be setting up uh, bigger times. And also trace and report the changes of the state in the logs just to see well, what happens when you have a, a call. Next thing is, uh, aside from the book I have mentioned earlier, a slow, well, if slow responses are worse, the no response, the worst must be, surely be a slow failure response. So it means that, well, if you have a failure, so at least you would like to learn about it quickly rather than after 10 seconds. So it's called fail fast. Uh, I will, well, relate to this earlier. Uh, but um, one thing that is Scala 
closely, closely scala related, is blocking pulse isolation. Uh, I think it has been mentioned already several times today. Uh, so importance is, is definitely significant. Uh, but basically a few rules. Uh, if you have so-called CPU bound task, just use the global, the global uh, execution context uh, that you will find in implicit. And uh, if you have uh, I.O. bound task, so-called I.O. bound, so something that is blocking, like a call to a database, uh, you should use a dedicated uh, execution context, even though you can use something like a blocking annotation, blocking function in the uh, execution context. Uh, the reason for that, there is a limitation to, by default, 256 uh, threads that you can use, and also it's not fun if other, <coughs> if other services actually saturate uh, uh, this uh, limit. And isolate the execution context between services. Uh, I will skip through the fast, fast but just to uh, remember about using the service I have already mentioned. Uh, don't let, let the request to pile up. One just rule of a thumb, if you are using ACCA, just look if you are not using uh, unbounded context. Because a bounded context means, means for you that if you have timeout in an actor, you may pile up 10,000 messages, and when the actor is up, it will first start processing those, actually causing all of them trashed, because all of them will be, well, not necessary any longer. The last thing I will uh, tell you about, the last pattern, and I think I will end my presentation here, uh, is something called uh, speculative retry. Uh, so things that we have observed are called, uh, uh, were irregular delays, unexpected error rates speaks, and 99th uh, percentile hiccups. Uh, so none of those patterns actually could be addressed with, with uh, the patterns I have mentioned earlier. So uh, the things we can come out with uh, so is called a speculative retry. So this diagram actually uh, explains what it means. Uh, practically, uh, it boils down to starting a retry operation, not waiting uh, for previous uh, attempts uh, to fail. So you start the first one, it can fail, like this guy actually singing, not waiting for anything. But not waiting for him to return, you start another one. And if the second one doesn't even well, meet the threshold, you can start the third one uh, starting the same request. And the first one that actually meet, with, who meets the goal uh, is, is uh, concluded, is concluding the whole operation. Uh, so we use it when timeout is not good enough, for the reasons mentioned earlier. Uh, we, when we want to retry very aggressively, like for instance, we have a timeout of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, set to uh, 20 or 100 milliseconds, and we do the retries, attemptive retries, every 20 milliseconds, and we do the five attempts, and we wait for the first response, in this case. So again, since it's time-related thing, uh, we uh, relate uh, to Monix. I haven't put the code here, <coughs> just well to spare you, but also I value your intelligence, so uh, it's very fun exercise actually to do it at home. Uh, I'll just leave you a few hints. Uh, Monix comes with something called defer future, so you can use it to start succeeding um, attempts with delay. Uh, you, can <coughs> you can use promise being used to uh, satisfy either attempt and Monix comes with cancelable which can be used to cancel all the attempts that are not needed any longer and lastly you can use task scheduler uh, a test scheduler to test this uh, approach uh, easily in your tests so I think since, since I have run out of time I will, I will stop here if you have any further questions, well, please hit me. And, and by the way, <clears throat> the book I was referring to, if you would like to, uh, if you have time to read it, 
is called Release It, so I recommend it to everyone uh, who would like to start his journey, her journey with services. So it's kind of a Bible.